I remember like my first computer was a Pentium 100 megahertz. I would be in school and then a friend in school would say, I got a computer that's like 233 megahertz. And I'm like, how? I just bought mine. Mine is new. And then now you have something that is like twice and a little bit more faster. But that's how it happened for a long time in the sense that uh, the hardware every two years it would get for example, our CPUs, every two years, it would get twice faster. And for software engineering in general, what it meant for programmers, developers, is that if you write a code today and you don't do anything with this code, two years later, you would have the opportunity to run this code twice faster. But this is no longer true today. So what it means is that before we had only one CPU that was getting faster and faster, but now we need to have multiple of them. And that actually changes the way we write software. And the languages that we consider mainstream languages, they are not as efficient, as effective as it could be. Imagine that, you know, like in the 80s, the telephones, it's really getting widespread, right? Everybody's installing a phone. If you have a city with millions of people, right? You need to install a bunch of telephone switches and you have calls coming all the time, right? And the calls going out, so information is coming and going. When it's working hours, you have much more people using the phones, right? And all this kind of stuff. So they had to solve this problem three decades ago and they did. So what happened is that Ericsson, they created Erlang. This technology that they created, right, in the 80s to solve all these problems, it's going to be perfect to solve those issues that we are having right now with concurrency, those issues that we are having with uh, the web in general, right? I think that was the moment when I had the idea of creating a programming language. Like, look, I have this absolutely beautiful piece of software, which is the Erlang Virtual Machine. I want to use it more but it's missing some stuff and I want to try adding this missing stuff. So in 2012, it was the moment that I started working on Elixir part-time. And I think we can use the software to expose an alternative for the programming community if they're interested in solving all those challenges that we're having right now. You can do everything on the internet, you can find everything, you can book everything, but it's still in silos. So you will find your flights on Skyscanner, in Kayak, you will find your, your rail connections on Bande E. You have to figure out how do I get to the airport, how much will my transition time will be, what is, uh, what is the prices of different tickets from different airports and so on. And uh, we, we thought it would be a great idea to have this in one UI. You would enter your origin and you would enter your destination and we find the whole itinerary. We immediately realized that this is something that is very hard to do. For every search that we do, we have to open a lot of connections to different transport operators. We have a lot of connections open at the same time to different operators, and you have to consume this data and process it in a smart way, and it has to be fast. This was basically the point where we thought about what technology is the right technology to go for. One of the characteristics that we were looking for was scalability. We literally have tens of thousands of connections open all the time and in both directions. And this is one thing that is Elixir is very good for this and very low in terms of the resources you need on the server side. We pretty fast came to the conclusion that Elixir is the right technology for our problem. We used, of course, job boards like Anipod and others to find people. We also basically trained people that did something else before and train them to Elixir. Of course, we have some hiccups sometimes in, in the code or we have some, some bugs that we created, but we never had outages in terms of the infrastructure, which is for me a very good indication that this is the right technology decision because I never experienced this before. So one of the big things about Elixir and that we get exactly from building on top of Darling VM is that we can write distributed software, software that runs in more than one machine. So you can see here I have two machines. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start one Elixir session on this machine 
and another Elixir session on this machine. So in this one, I'm starting something called Interactive Elixir uh, on both of them. But this one, uh, this is Bob's machine. So I'm going to say, hey, this Elixir instance has the name of Bob. Bob. And we have a secret here, a cookie, which is a secret, but we're just calling it secret right now. So I'm going to start this session here on Bob, and I'm going to do the same thing on Alice. So I'm starting Alice, Alice sec, uh, session with the same cookie secret. All right, so what I'm going to do this is that I'm going to define some Elixir code. And I know this is a little, a little bit cliche, right? But I'm going to define a module called hello with a function called world in it. And I'm going to, and what all this function does is that it prints hello world. So I defined this code, ignore the whole gibberish for now, but I defined this code and then I, now I can call hello dot world. And you can see that it prints hello world, beautiful, right? So it works, this is very exciting. So this is Bob's computer, but now go, let's go to Alice's computer. If I try to invoke hello world, it doesn't work. Why? Because I define this code, I define the module hello with the function world only in Bob's computer. But we can solve this, right? Because it's distributed, I can make those machines talk to each other. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to say, hey, I want on Alice's machine, she's going to say, hey, I'm going to tell Bob to execute this code for me. So you're going to say, hey, Bob, the Bob instance that is running on Bob machine, I want you to execute the hello world code. And now when I do this, we can see that we got hello world printed back. We can see that it works, right? Because Alice was able to tell Bob, execute this code for me. Bob executed that code and say, hey, I executed this code and this code has a hello world message that I'm sending back to you so you can print. And that's it. And what is really exciting about this is that we can build a bunch of uh, interesting technology that just runs on these nodes being connected. So for example, the Phoenix uh, web framework, it has a presence feature and has a pub sub mechanism. So with the pub sub, what you can do is that you can send messages to everybody connected to any machine. And with the presence feature, you can know everybody that is connected in the whole cluster and you can know who is joining, who is leaving, and we can do all of that without adding databases, without adding third-party dependencies. We just use the distributed feature, which is really exciting. One of the things that we did since the beginning is that the development was always open, always open source. So everybody could join at any time and give their ideas, contribute, share. So I also knew uh, from the beginning that if I wanted this thing to happen, I would have to go out and talk to a lot of people and go to different events and convince developers why they should care about the technology, what are the potentials of the technology and get them excited about it. We really started to see like an uptick in people using Elixir. And that was kind of like the beginning of a turning point because it was like, like people, they're actually starting to bet on this. So you don't feel alone in the sense that, you know, there are other people believing the potential and want to push it forward. And you know, with that, the interest, it only started to grow and grow in July 2014 was when we had the first Alexir event. such a great vibe, everybody gets along, and it's so easy to be able to just approach anybody that's there to ask questions. When I started with Elixir, I was amazed by the documentation that even was available at that time. Elixir is always typically thought of as being great for concurrency and fast, and so if you're kind of solving those kind of problems, then it's a really good choice. Whether you're building something to run on a Raspberry Pi Zero, $5 computer, or a 40-core server, like Elixir is going to be fantastically suited for. You can't exactly replicate uh, the environment in which people from the community are all in the same place. Elixir is going to be on a track to uh, start to conquer more and more industries. Uh, some of the obvious ones that we've seen so far have been working with uh, web development, uh, but the scalability there isn't just confined to building websites. Uh, we worked together with Chris and, uh, and Jose uh, from the Nerve side of things to be able to try to uh, increase the number of concurrent connections and push the boundaries of how many devices we can actually get simultaneously connected to Phoenix, for example, because we really believe that uh, it has 
capabilities of uh, Internet of Things connectivity uh, on the scale of millions of devices. And having that kind of connectivity starts to really open up the language and the industry uh, to start working in all these different kinds of ways. Phoenix is a web framework for the Elixir programming language and it really is like a batteries included web framework uh, for the platform. The first version of Phoenix as written uh, supported like 30,000 users on one server and then we made like 10 lines of change to the code and that's what gave us 2 million users. What kind of problems or businesses could I build if what before took 100 servers could today take two servers? And I think that's enabling a lot of innovation. So I think that's what's kind of bringing people in is this promise of uh, things that were either impossible to do before or prohibitively expensive to do. Now as a single developer or a couple people, you can come in and, and build something really compelling that, that wouldn't be do doable before. Right now we are, uh, we are in Elixir Conference in Warsaw. We see Elixir Conferences appearing all around the world. So we have in Mexico, Brazil, throughout the United States, we have a bunch of smaller conferences popping up. And then there are all the different talks where we can learn uh, new things. And also, which is always very interesting, is to learn like use cases. You build the tool and then people start using those tool in these very different ways. People are like, look, I actually realized that this tool is also very good for this. And then you're like, it makes sense. Like I watched the talk and it makes total sense. So all those things are very exciting. If I try to centralize and I try to do everything on my own, I won't be able to do it, but if we say, you know, everybody can contribute a small part to this and everybody together, decentralized, can do that and bring the community forward, then we have a chance of actually making a lasting, lasting impact. Beautiful.